I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's a check of first word news. President Trump addressed the annual NRA convention in Dallas. He told the gathering of gun owners his administration will always fight for the right to bear arms. Your, Your Second, Second Amendment, Amendment rights, rights are under siege, but they, but they will, will never, ever be under siege as, as long as, as I'm your president. president. Rudy Giuliani says payments to President Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen, were not a campaign violation. Giuliani put out a statement today to clarify comments he made, which suggested a disconnect with the White House. He also says Mr. Trump had the authority to fire former FBI Director James Comey. A federal judge today asked pointed questions about special counsel Robert Mueller's authority to bring charges against former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort, and he suggested that prosecutors' true motive is to get Manafort to, quote, sing against the president. Another top appointee is leaving the EPA. Deputy Associate Administrator John Kunkus is the fourth senior aide to announce departure plans under Administrator Scott Pruitt, whose top spokesperson, security chief, and super fund administrator are also leaving. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. Bloomberg Technology is next. Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Apple shares hit a record after Warren Buffett makes another big bet on the stock. Why investors are optimistic, the tech giant can sustain its growth. Plus, why Amazon lost out to Walmart in a battle over Flipkart, giving them an e-commerce edge in Southeast Asia. And the U.S. trade delegation heads home from Beijing after two days of talks ended with some agreement, but not much. What it means for the tech industry in the U.S. and Asia going forward. But first, to our lead, shares of Apple hitting a new all-time high, pushing the tech giant to striking distance of a $1 trillion valuation. The stock rose after billionaire investor Warren Buffett told CNBC he bought an additional 75 million shares of the iPhone maker in the first quarter, expanding his already large investment in the company. For more on Apple and investor perspective on the tech sector as earnings wrap up, let's bring in Kevin Kelly, who covers equity strategy at Bloomberg Intelligence, and Dan Ives, GBH Insights Chief strategy officer and head of tech research both in New York. Dan, I'll start with you. Big vote of confidence from Buffett. What is your read on this? Yeah, I mean, look, this was a major vote of confidence, especially just going through a white knuckle period over the last, call it, two weeks. You have the Buffett news, the buyback. You know, now you really sort of get into a June, September quarters, which are hittable and beatable, a massive product cycle on the horizon. And I think now this could be the yellow brick road to that trillion dollar market cap. You know, as I think there's good news ahead here, and I think investors are starting to re-rate the company as they sort of look ahead. And the buyback and the Buffett has just been a shot of good news taking shares to all-time highs. That said, Kevin, you know, the smartphone market is saturating. Will Apple continue to defy the odds? And if so, how far away is it from that $1 trillion mark? Well, I think what's really important to keep in mind here is for U.S. tech in general, you know, is the question in your lead where can you sustain this type of growth, right? For a long time, tech was really, you know, one of the primary sectors that you would go to if you're looking for that, that earnings growth uh, moving forward. Now, what we have seen, um, and, and this is something that Dan was alluding to, is the shareholder friendly activity out of Apple is something that we've been covering in terms of looking at broad market buybacks. And that $100 billion is going to go a long way uh, for the tech sector moving forward. Alibaba shares also jumped today on the back of earnings. They have been unapologetic about ramping up their investments, and they say that will continue. Dan, you know, what do you make of that? Look, I mean, it's no different than what Amazon's doing or what Netflix is doing. I mean, they are in super uber growth mode. You saw that on the e-commerce front. I mean, 60% growth, you know, even investing on cloud. And I think right now this is a land grab opportunity. Just like you're seeing Amazon e-commerce around the U.S. I mean, Alibaba is just in a massive position of strength. And that's why I think investors are cheering the strategy. And I think this is just another vote of confidence 
for that overall e-commerce market. As the two giants, you got Alibaba and now Amazon, you know, really are, it, it, it's sort of two horse race here, depending on geographic where you look. And I think this is also when Alibaba, they're gonna continue to expand to other areas. And that's why this investment, I think it's a smart strategy at this point. So, Kevin, you know, what does this say about the health of uh, the U.S. tech market versus the China tech market, which, you know, by the way, just a few weeks ago, there were analysts out there saying that a tech bubble had been burst and a lot of what was lost has been recovered just in the last few weeks, given the earnings reports. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at the, ch the China tech versus the U.S. tech argument, one of the big things that we've been noting is the rate of growth. But we talked about the tech sector being a place where you would go for this, this bottom line EPS growth. If you look at China tech, it's actually projected to grow twice as fast as U.S. tech over the next 12 months. And when you look at the valuations, yes, they're a little bit higher for these Chinese tech companies on a price to earnings multiple basis. But that's what you would expect if they're expected to grow faster. And at the same time, they're pretty much in line, these valuations are pretty much in line with what you would expect over the last 10 years based on averages. So Chinese tech, st tech stocks, from a valuation perspective, don't look too stretched um, and are projected to grow twice as fast as the U.S. market. You know, obviously Apple is so heavily weighted here, Dan. You know, what role does Apple play in simply the, the overall sentiment around the tech sector as a whole? I mean, look, this was just a game-changing week. I mean, if you go back a week and a half ago, the New York City cab driver was negative on Apple going into the print. And now really what comes out after is that, you know, guidance much better than feared. The iPhone 10 is not dead. It's actually one of the best-selling phones out there. And now they're going into this massive product cycle. It's a huge confidence boost for the tech sector, for the market. And then you almost take a step back. I mean, you look at the fang names, look at Facebook, you got Apple, you, know, you go across the board, Netflix, Google. I mean, this is really one where I think these sort of tech earnings with Apple front and center, I think is really going to put some more gasoline in the bull's engine over the coming weeks and months. That's why we're not a fan of the, you know, selling May and go away. I think this is actually something that's setting up to see a multiple re-rating, especially on a lot of these tech stocks with obviously Apple on its race to hit that trillion dollar mark cap, you know, ideally before the September time frame. Now, these trade issues are a concern for Apple, especially given how much of its products uh, are manufactured in China. We're going to be talking about uh, a potential trade war with China later, later in the show, given the trade talks happening. But, but Kevin, how could um, you know, some of these issues impact the China versus U.S. tech sector? Absolutely. I mean, when you look at U.S. tech, as you mentioned, you know, large exposure to China. So obviously these trade talks are going to be very, very uh, important for the implications for the sector moving forward. What I will say, though, is that where they might affect uh, analyst expectations is what we're really watching for. You've seen analysts haven't really revised up their EPS expectations until very recently for the U.S. tech sector. And that's going to be important because are these companies going to become victims to their own success over the last few years? Whereas when you're growing on pace 20 percent for the U.S. tech sector in the first quarter, can you sustain that? whereas the expectations for next year fall off by about 10%. So I think that's going to be really important is seeing how analysts come out and actually try to price this in. So I got to talk to you about Tesla, Dan. Dan. Obviously, uh, we saw shares recover today after that uh, truly bizarre, as analysts called it, earnings call um, with Elon Musk. You know, he also today tweeted, the two questioners I ignored on that call are sell side analysts who represent a short seller thesis, not investors. You know, what do you make of, of his, his behavior and how to interpret it? And look, I mean, the, definitely, obviously, in what I'd say in 20 years, one of the strangest, the, probably the strangest call I've ever been on. But that's part of Musk. I mean, the visionary who he is, the double-edged sword, you saw it take place in that call. I mean, this was not the way to handle it. And But I think the way the stocks reacted show that investors are kind of seeing through it, looking at the fundamental production issues, can they narrow that gap and almost taking out some of the noise, how Musk handled it. But it, look, this is a handholding period. And, you know, I think this is a situation where he's going to have to be at least a little more street savvy and or handle these calls better because patience is wearing thin. It also comes down to fundamentals and the production gap and cash burn. But I definitely don't think this was a call that would go in the uh, Investor Relations Hall of Fame. So. Kevin, looking forward to the next few weeks, what are you going to be watching? 
What we're watching for is the end of uh, earnings season here in the U.S. I mean, tech stocks, as we mentioned, are on pace for, for great growth, 20%. Uh, in the first quarter versus 13% expectations heading into this season. Um, but what'll be interesting is when you're looking at it from a technical perspective over the next few weeks, we really wanna see, there's been a lot of talk about the market in general with these 200 day moving averages bouncing off of that. We saw tech do that as well, um, you know, this week and, and uh, had the, the index has since moved higher um, above some of these 50, 100 and 200 day moving averages. And it'll be interesting to see if, and what we'll be watching for is if tech can actually uh, keep up that momentum, especially relative to the broader index. So, Dan, same question to you. you know, going forward, what do you have your eye on? Look, I think a big focus here, obviously, the, the U.S.-China situation in the back, it, we'll call it, it's background noise now, but fundamentally, that's just something that can't really uh, fester in terms of how it impact U.S. tech, specifically Apple. What we're really looking for here is really the earnings acceleration into the rest of the year. I mean, you saw the tax benefit, but I think fundamentally it's really cloud, cybersecurity. I think those are some themes, even big data, that we're going to see continuing to kind of play out over the coming months. And you really have a consumer and enterprise themes that are both really playing out. And it's just a secular growth market. But there's obviously a haves and a have nots. And you saw that with the snap earnings, you know, really being a have not. And that's why we're really focused also on social media to look at Facebook, Twitter, Snap, see the share gains based on our survey work, and do advertisers continue to stick with Facebook? And we continue to believe that that damage is contained. And at least so far, Zuckerberg and Facebook have navigated that storm well. So while we're on that topic, uh, Bloomberg broke a story today that Facebook is researching an ad-free subscription model. What's your take on that? Look, they have to. I mean, they have to at least research it uh, in terms of just everything that's gone on sort of post-Cambridge. But, but how many people would pay for it? Yeah, but ultimately, it's negligible the amount of people that would pay for it and it would go against the model. So that's why this is something where they research a lot of things and never come to market no different than any other tech company. So I view this as one where I would not pay too much close attention to that because I do not see that model changing in terms of the nature of the Facebook ad model. I think if they went to a paid model and there's some sort of subscription, it would really go against the DNA of Zuckerberg and Facebook. And I think that's something that's very important as they navigate going forward to stick to their model. All right, Dan Ives with GBH Insights and our very own Kevin Kelly. Thank you both. Lots to watch. Coming up, Flipkart's board has approved an agreement to sell about 75% of the company to Walmart, what it means for rival Amazon next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. a developing story a self-driving Waymo vehicle was involved in a crash in Arizona the vehicle was reportedly traveling at slow speed in autonomous mode authorities say there was a minor injury in the collision the vehicle was quote in the wrong place at the wrong time according to the police we're going to continue to monitor headlines on this as we get them well the way has been cleared for Walmart to make a huge bet on international expansion. In India, the board of Flipkart has agreed to sell about 75% of the e-commerce company to Walmart for approximately $15 billion. That's according to people familiar with the matter. Amazon had also made a bid for Flipkart. Joining us now for more, Bloomberg Tech's senior executive editor Brad Stone in New York. So Brad, what do you make of the fact that Walmart got this and not Amazon? Well, you know, Amazon's bid was always uh, was always a long shot. Um, you Flipkart's the number one online retailer in India, you know, massive growing uh, market with a population of 1.3 billion people. But Amazon is a close number two, probably gr growing faster at Flipkart at this point. So the idea that, you know, Amazon would make this investment was probably never going to pass regulatory muster. You know, they were offering a rather large kill fee. Uh, but, you know, here Walmart comes in, you know, with a strong investment um, and, uh, you know, part, part of its international expansion and a shift in the retailers really 
migration of its international footprint from the West now to India and China. Well, Amazon obviously has India ambitions. How would you compare Walmart's international footprint to Amazon? Yeah, um, it's um, it's getting smaller, right? They they sold uh, their interest in their uh, British grocery uh, to Jay Sansbury, so consolidating there, taking a 42% stake in the combined company. You know, they're strong in, in Mexico. They've got a great business in Canada. They're selling their Brazilian operation. And, you know, again, they're making a bet here on, on China and India, you know, two of the, of the fastest growing markets and populations in the world. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the ambitions for both of these companies, Amazon and Walmart, you know, they start in China, where really they got a late start, and Alibaba has kind of conquered the e-commerce landscape there, and they're applying the lessons uh, and the bruises that they experienced in China to India, and they don't want to be late, and both companies are willing to make rather significant investments to avoid a repeat of what happened in China. So. You know, SoftBank holds a stake in Flipkart. What happens to that? Uh, there, uh, my understanding from our uh, great reporting from my colleague Saritha Ray uh, is SoftBank, which doesn't like to be a passive investor, is selling their stake uh, at, a, at, I believe, a $20 billion valuation and a rather nice, significant pro uh, profit for Masayoshi-san. Now, we touched on this earlier, but uh, Facebook is... Bloomberg broke the news today, our own Sarah Fryer, researching an ad-free subscription model. Talk to us a little bit more about what we know. Is this just exploratory or is this, you know, moving towards some, you know, realistic initiative? Yeah, you know, I, I think we there have been rumors for a long time that, you know, that Facebook would do that. I think the company itself was always quite resistant uh, to the idea of charging for Facebook, you know, Sheryl Sandberg very much vocally committed to an advertising supported model. She believes relevant ads make the service better. But I think they have, you know, taken such punishment over the last few months for ad targeting and for the the alleged privacy violations with the Cambridge Analytica scandal that, you know, Sarah's reporting has suggested that there is a really a groundswell of support for a, a subscription service uh, that, you know, suspends advertising. And look, it's partly a function of where, you know, the internet is taking us these days. You know, our, our here at Bloomberg, we've introduced a paywall uh, this, uh, just this week. Subscription models are in, you know, ushered in by the likes of Netflix and Amazon Prime. So it's perhaps not a surprise that Facebook is reevaluating this question and say, hey, if maybe there are some users that are willing to pay for a version of Facebook without ads, then we should give them that. Well, you know, in his testimony, Mark Zuckerberg said there will always be a version of Facebook that is free, which, of course, had many people asking the question, OK, well, there is, is there going to be a version that's not free? You know, is this something that, you know, we heard uh, Dan Ives, the analyst, earlier saying that if anyone was willing to pay for it, it would be, you know, a tiny group of people. Is this something that Facebook could offer as a sort of olive branch? Like, hey, if, if you want to pay for it, um, we do have an option for you to do that without these ads. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, one of the one of the aspects or the elements of advertising on Facebook is that, you know, it's not in your face, you know, and, and so I think that the proposition then to ask people to pay to get rid of the ads is a tough one. And we are now so accustomed through 10 years of habitual use to not paying for Facebook that, you know, it's it's probably going to be challenging. But I think you raise a good point. You know, maybe this is in some ways a defensive measure to say that if there are users that want to go turn off all advertising uh, and targeting that, you, you know, you're giving them an option to go do that and use a service that, uh, you know, brings a lot of value. You're just going to be paying for it in a different way. All right. Bloomberg Tech's Brad Stone in New York. Thank you so much, Brad, for stopping by today. On your way back. Coming up, Weight Watchers has seen a lot of success thanks to its app and digital strategy. We're going to hear from CEO Mindy Grossman next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mushrat Carmiel of Bloomberg News in New York. 157 is the Midtown skyscraper that has symbolized both Manhattan's luxury condo boom and its slowdown. It just had its best sales quarter in more than a year. The secret? A good bargain. Four years after completing the 90-story tower and setting a New York City sales record with a $100.5 million condo deal, the developer, Extel, is still working to sell the building out. 
It had a good start to the year. It sold five apartments totaling $73 million, the strongest quarter since 2016. All the apartments were sold at a discount. In some cases, the developer agreed to pay the closing costs. In a market where thousands of new luxury units are under construction, price chopping is the surest way to clear the deck and keep ahead of the competition. Across the borough, all luxury homes that found buyers in the first quarter had their asking prices cut by an average of 10%. I'm Oshrat Carmiel for Bloomberg News in New York. You can follow me on Twitter at at Oshrat Carmiel and get the latest updates at TikTok. has jumped nearly 60% this year thanks to rising demand and a high-profile partnership with Oprah Winfrey. But the tech industry has been encroaching on the weight loss business. CEO Mindy Grossman joined Bloomberg Daybreak Americas and talked about the company's digital strategy. Every month we sync with 1.3 million activity devices. And as we continue to integrate that and create that engagement, we have 1.7 million people who monthly are in our closed loop community platform. And hence, that's why our engagement is so significant. And actually, my, some of my favorite stats, so we had 2.5 million people use our barcode scanner and 260 million foods tracked. So that's 260 million opportunities for engagement. Mm -hmm. And so we're not just a program. The community aspect of what we do is so powerful, which is why we're spending and investing in all of the assets to make that journey and even more personalized and using the data and using the AI so everybody can feel it's their WW. And that app becomes, for people, the first thing they look at in the morning and when they go to bed. Ant Financial posted a 65% jump in profit in the fiscal year as it expanded its footprint in wealth management, consumer lending, and overseas markets. The Chinese fintech firm disclosed its financials as it's expected to seek an initial public offering. Ant Financial, controlled by Alibaba co-founder Jack Ma, is in the process of raising at least $10 billion at a valuation of $150 billion from investors. The CBS Viacom merger could be getting closer this after Reuters reports. Sherry Redstone is willing to make concessions in the deal. Redstone has offered to drop her demand that Viacom CEO Bob Backish become the company's second in command as long as he sits on the board. This would set up CBS COO Joseph Ianello to succeed current CEO Les Moonves. And coming up, trade talks break down. We look at what went wrong and right as the U.S.-China trade talks ended. That's next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's your first word news. As he left the White House en route to the NRA convention in Dallas, President Trump told reporters he didn't trust the motives behind special counsel Robert Mueller's request for an interview. I have to find that we're going to be treated fairly because everybody sees it now and it is a pure witch hunt. Right now, it's a pure witch hunt. Why don't we have Republicans looking also? Why aren't we having Republican people doing what all these Democrats are doing? It is a very unfair thing. If I thought it was fair, I would override my lawyers. The president's lawyers say they have concerns that during extended questioning, Mueller might try to trap the president into committing perjury. International mediators gathered in France to mark the end of ETA after a decades-long campaign against Spain that killed more than 850 people. Mass civilians also participated. Among those in attendance, former Sinn Féin leader Jerry Adams. The Basque peace process and the courageous steps that have been taken over recent days and years like the Irish process, are an example of what is possible when people of goodwill, determination and vision don't lose hope and don't give up. 
But Spain's Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy has promised to continue prosecuting ETA militants. Russia says international chemical weapons inspectors have finished their investigation in the Syrian town of Douma, the site of a suspected chemical attack last month. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons is expected to issue a report. Protesters used a slingshot to bring down an Israeli drone in Gaza today as demonstrations near the border with Israel entered week number six. Thousands of Palestinians swarmed the area with some burning tires and throwing stones as Israeli soldiers fired live bullets and volleys of tear gas. Results released from this week's local elections in the UK showed opposition labor gaining ground in some areas, but the party unable to dent conservative strongholds in key parts of London. Hawaiian officials say extremely high levels of sulfur dioxide gas have been detected in areas near the eruption of the Kilauea volcano. Nearly 1,500 residents were ordered to evacuate after the volcano began spewing molten lava. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology is next. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Two days of high-level trade talks between the U.S. and China have led to an agreement to keep on talking and little else. The U.S. delegation, led by Treasury Sec Secretary Steven Mnuchin, departed Beijing amidst reports that both sides reached a consensus on some issues while acknowledging major disagreements on others. That sparked a wide variety of takes from Bloomberg television guests on Friday. Take a listen. I have to say the demands right now are quite high. I think that's going to be a, a, a very difficult task. The question is, does Donald Trump really just want some kind of tweetable wins? There used to be a talk of 100 billion, now it's 200 billion. The conversations we had uh, in Washington very recently, they point to a much more abrasive agenda. If they're even half serious about this, that the, the tech war, um, which is already on between the U.S. and China, just got much uglier. You could get a kind of positive outcome if this is the art of the deal, going in with big asks, getting a few small wins in return. I I'm not sure we can count on that, so I probably would expect that this would be kind of more market negative over the next few months. Joining me now to talk about this further in New York, we have Isaac Stonefish, senior fellow at the Asia Society and in D.C., Sarah McGregor, who leads Bloomberg's U.S. economic coverage. Sarah, let's start at the beginning. You know, where did they disagree and where did they make some agreement? So pretty much the only agreement that we really know about right now, and again, we haven't had any official briefings or, or press statements with specifics, the parties agreed that they were going to continue their dialogue. So that's that's what we know right now. What really was exposed, though, I think, from these meetings is just how gaping and yawning these differences are right now of what the U.S. sees as needed in, in, to change the relationship and what China wants. And I think it was kind of positioned by the U.S. on its way over that it was going to go over with some demands and have these talks and see what it could get from China. But what became clear is that China also has requests that it wants from the U.S. It doesn't think the relationship's perfect either. And so so actually, we are presented now with a very long list of demands. Top is, you know, Trump's been pretty single-minded on the idea of reducing the trade deficit, and that was sort of the, the top-line request from the U.S. Well, and there's been a yawning difference going on here for many, many years now. Isaac, which of these demands are reasonable, which are unreasonable on both sides? I think it's reasonable for the United States to want China to be a less protectionist economy and to want China to stop with the state-sponsored hacking of commercial secrets. I think a lot of the differences stem from the idea that many in China have that their country is still a developing nation and deserves to be more protectionist than a developed nation, and the idea that a lot of people in America have that China is the world's second largest economy. It's incredibly competent in a lot of different areas of global trade and economics, and it deserves to be treated as such. So, Sarah, you know, obviously they said that they're going to continue talking, but it, is it realistic to think they're going to find more common ground within the bounds of the Trump administration? 
It was really surprising when uh, reporters, including Bloomberg, got a hold of these lists of demands at just how, how big they were. There was, you know, I mean, because we didn't really know what the negotiating objective was going over there, it wasn't really publicly announced previous to them, to the delegation leaving, we didn't know if they'd come back with a few business deals and say, you know what, deal done, you know, everything's back on track again. And so uh, I think given the, the very extreme sides, these hardline demands, we're going to see uh, what could be a pretty protracted and, and tough negotiation. If NAFTA is a guide, there's been some analysts who have said, you know, the U.S. made some pretty hardline demands on NAFTA and it seems to be softening them. So maybe it'll do the same with China. But as it stands right now, this seems, if anything, to exasperate tensions than, than cool them. Talk to us, Isaac, about the challenges facing tech companies in particular. We talked a lot about Apple because, you know, their products are, you know, very much manufactured in China, but also you have Chinese companies concerned about selling their products in the United States. I don't think there's a way to spin what happened as good for tech companies in the U.S or in China. And I think especially American tech companies in China face a lot of very real concerns about privacy, about the sanctity of their information, about the need to censor, to be in the Chinese market. And I think these trade tensions and increased suspicion on the Chinese side about American companies are going to make it even more difficult for American tech companies to find a good foothold in China. So. Look, um, you know, history doesn't always repeat itself, as we've seen with North Korea, though a lot still remains to be seen there. But, you know, China hasn't budged on these issues for a very, very long time, Isaac. You know, how realistic is it to think they ever will? I think if there's a way for the U.S. to position it so that it's not China giving in to some of these demands, but a compromise that... Beijing is able to sell domestically. So this idea of reducing the trade deficit, for example, if it's instead packaged on both the American and the Chinese side as a way for Beijing to move its economy away from one reliant on exports and towards one more reliant on domestic consumption, which many economists think is a great way for China to go as well, and many Chinese reformers in the party think so as well, it'll be a lot more likely for that to happen, for that to lower the trade deficit than if it it's China yielding to the United States. I think the other thing is if Trump pa packages together other national security desires and is willing to yield on some of those in exchange for trade, then Beijing might decide to yield. So, Sarah, in what context will talks continue? What is next? So the delegation that was led by the Treasury Secretary is, um, it might still be in the air. We're not 100% sure whether they've landed yet or not, but they will shortly if they haven't. They're supposed to give Trump a briefing, and the White House said today that Trump will take decisions from there. So we definitely expect over the coming days to get a bit more of a readout from the administration itself. But it's quite clear that these, you know, Trump campaigned on a promise of creating jobs and growing the economy. Part of that might be manufacturing, but that's a bit of an old-fashioned view. And I think right now the U.S. sees itself very much in a race with, with China on the tech side. And this isn't an issue that's going to go away, nor can be solved in the next day or two either. So um, I, I'm really interested to see how this is going to play out, what companies' reactions are in Silicon Valley, and what happens on the ground for them, um, you know, for businesses that do have a relationship in the Chinese market. All right, Bloomberg Sarah McGregor and Isaac Stone of the Asia Society, thank you both. Well, Google is taking steps to increase transparency across U.S. political ads on its platforms. Google will now require verification for anyone who wants to buy an election ad in the U.S., as well as confirmation that the buyer is a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. The company said ads must also have a clear disclosure on who's paying for it. Google also plans to release a transparency report specifically focused on election ads this summer and a searchable library for Google-based election ads. Coming up, from protecting your networks to listing on the NASDAQ, we're going to speak to the CEO of Carbon Black on their public debut next. And this weekend on Bloomberg Television, we bring you our best interviews from the week, including highlights from our conversations at the Milk and Global Conference in L.A. and our conversation with Microsoft Chair John Thompson. Tune in this Saturday for the best of Bloomberg technology. This is Bloomberg.
NASDAQ welcomed a new member on Friday as cybersecurity firm Carbon Black went public. The shares rose 26% above the $19 IPO price. Bloomberg Steel's reporter Alex Brinka caught up with Carbon Black CEO Patrick Morley to get his thoughts on their debut. Carbon Black uh, is a cybersecurity leader, and we're disrupting a really big market right now, uh, a $19 billion market. And so uh, we're very focused on making sure that we get our company name and brand out there. And so certainly uh, we'll be spending some of those dollars on sales and marketing and, and bringing the company out to international markets as well. So cybersecurity, it's a big space. Um, you all do endpoint security, your cloud-based company. Patrick, that's a lot of tech jargon. Break down for me, what exactly do you do for your customers? Yeah, so you should think about Carbon Black as a company uh, that helps organizations protect their devices, their laptops, their servers, uh, their data centers. Uh, we help protect them, and the fundamental belief that Carbon Black has is that it's all about the data. Uh, the company that collects the richest set of data and is able to analyze that data is the company that's best positioned to be able to help companies uh, see and stop hackers across the globe. So when you think about the customers you're selling into, uh, what comes to mind for me are big organizations whose, uh, whose employees, as you said, use laptops, use uh, tablets, work from home. Are there other devices that you see your customers using these days that's an opportunity for you to help them protect as they're trying to keep all of their uh, private data private? Yeah, I mean, we protect, Carbon Black protects uh, any device that runs a, a workload of, of some, some type. And as the world has changed over the last few years, as uh, increasingly workers are mobile and network security cannot just protect everyone because we're all out working from homes, from coffee shops, uh, and we're increasingly seeing new types of devices that are IP connected uh, to the internet, the way you have to protect those devices is fundamentally different. And that's what Carbon Black does. And so in addition to what you would think about as an endpoint or a device, we protect many non-standard devices out there from the control systems that run utilities, nuclear power plants, oil rigs, pipelines, ATMs, point of sale systems, uh, and a lot of non-traditional devices that sit as part of transportation systems like trains, etc. So we protect many, many devices out there uh, across the globe uh, and helping organizations uh, protect themselves from hackers. And it seems like these days hackers, those bad actors, are getting more clever, uh, hence the need for uh, products like yours. You have a threat analysis unit. Where are you seeing folks, uh, these malicious actors, get more creative? Are there new things that are on the mind of the chief security officers at your customers that they're trying to kind of block and tackle against? Yeah. Well, fundamentally, the big change we've seen over the last uh, three or four years is leveraging good software to actually drive the attacks. So most of us in the general public think about attacks as viruses. Someone's going to use a virus to attack me. But for organizations, for large companies, and Carbon Black protects 33 of the Fortune 100 and uh, thousands of others, very large and important brands across the globe, the attacks that are being used against companies these days increasingly just use software that's good. And so the traditional approach of trying to identify software as a virus or as bad uh, is, doesn't work anymore. It fundamentally is broken. And so Carbon Black brings a, a very unique approach to helping protect those organizations. Our core premise uh, is that it's all about the data and that our ability, Carbon Black's ability to collect the richest set of data in the marketplace allows us to see and stop hackers, uh, whether or not they're using viruses or increasingly using good software to run an attack. So one of the popular tropes I hear in the tech deals world is that uh, small security companies can't be standalone. Obviously, as the CEO of a smaller company uh, than some of the competitors like Symantec or even a Cisco, you disagree with that. What's your argument uh, for being a standalone company and not tie up with, say, one of your partners like VMware or IBM? Yeah, so Carbon Black uh, has a unique approach uh, on how we're disrupting the marketplace, and uh, we certainly partner with some great companies out there, and, uh, and, and that's part of our, our strategy is to work with, with great vendors in the marketplace. But uh, we're building a large standalone cybersecurity company. Uh, we have over 900 employees globally, uh, 3,700 companies out there that depend on us, that trust on us, uh, and who we work for every single day to ensure their safety. And we think in front of us, given the opportunity we're going after, we can build a very large company on our own.
If you were to rank them, where's the growth going to come from first? Is it new customers or is it pushing into further into your existing customers? It, it, it's it's both. It's it's certainly uh, acquiring new customers both here domestically and in, in, in the U.S. and Canada. Increasingly, international markets is a big focus for Carbon Black, uh, and uh, and and we also certainly have the opportunity to offer them more services on top of the data that we collect, going back to our customers and and, and selling them uh, more services to help keep them safe. That was Carbon Black CEO Patrick Morley speaking with our very own Alex Barinka. Well, Disney and Marvel's blockbuster Avengers Infinity War is on track to become the fastest film to cross the billion dollar mark at the global box office. Infinity War finished Thursday with a worldwide total of $905 million, including $338 million in North America. It is expected to hit the milestone this weekend, and when it does, it beats out Star Wars The Force Awakens, another Disney production for the top spot. Coming up, Apple shares hit an all-time high thanks to Warren Buffett. Why the billionaire investor upped his investment in the iPhone maker next. This is Bloomberg. A story we continue to watch. Apple executive Eddie Q will be questioned by Qualcomm's lawyers as part of a legal battle between the companies over billions of dollars in patents and licensing fees. On Friday, a San Diego federal judge ordered Q to be deposed in the case, granting Qualcomm a Qualcomm request and turning down Apple's arguments against the move. At the heart of the standoff is a dispute over how much Qualcomm can charge phone makers to use its patents, whether or not they use its chips. Apple has cut off license payments to Qualcomm and filed an antitrust lawsuit that accused the chip maker of trying to monopolize the industry. Apple shares hit a record after Warren Buffett told CNBC he bought an additional 75 million shares of the iPhone maker in the first quarter. The Apple purchase cost between $11 billion and $14 billion and adds to the almost 170 million shares that Berkshire Hathaway owned at the end of 2017. Apple was already Buffett's biggest shareholder at the time, shareholding at the time. Joining us now with more, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who covers all things Apple. So um, your take on the Buffett buy-in here. It's interesting. It's a vote of confidence from one of the world's most renowned investors, obviously, with you know his past dealings in Berkshire Hathaway. And it's sort of the Buffett name is a very strong name. And when you hear Buffett is investing in something, it adds to confidence from analysts and other investors. So I think that's why it had had such a significant impact on the market. But of course, he hasn't always made the best decision in tech. In if you look at IBM, for example, which he subsequently sold off, you know, do we think Apple can continue to divide, to divide the odds in the smartphone market? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the smartphone market, if you look at it, it's not only slowing, but it's contracting. And I don't think Apple's going to start to see a decline in smartphone sales. I think consumers will always have a device that they carry with them. I think the shape and the form will change over time. Many people thought that was the Apple Watch, but so far, the Apple Watch hasn't been a runaway hit like the iPhone. It's not selling in iPhone-like quantities, and it doesn't have to yet. But at the point the smartphone market starts to dwindle and stop growing, there will have to be something to add to Apple's growth. Because across Apple's history, they've always had a big growth product. So they're on track to hit that trillion dollar market cap. How long could that take? Till they hit it? Well, we thought it was going to happen a little bit earlier this year. But now that the Buffett news came out and the stock spiked a little bit today after the surprisingly positive earnings results on Tuesday, a lot of people think it's going to happen sooner than later. The latest estimates I've seen are sometime this year, probably by the fall. But that changes rapidly. You look on the ticker, you see in the DES function that the market cap can shift all the way from the high 800s to the low 900s. So we'll see. Eddie Q being called to testify in this Qualcomm situation. What's your take? It's an interesting one. I was actually looking through all the paperwork files by Apple and Qualcomm earlier today. Apple saying there's no reason that Qualcomm needs to depose Eddie Q. And for those interested, Eddie Q is their SVP, senior executive in charge of cloud services. He's like been there many, many years. Many years. He was a very close confidant of Steve Jobs and now Tim Cook. Um, but in addition, what most people don't know, in addition to running Apple Music, he's also Apple's chief negotiator. And he's been roped into very important deals over the course of Apple's history. One of them being the iPhone deal with what was called Singular at the time, now AT&T, negotiating that exclusivity agreement back in 2007 when the first iPhone was launched. So for that reason, Qualcomm wants him to be deposed. Wow, so this goes way back. 
Yeah, it's ancient history. He, he's been there for a while, and being the negotiator, the lead negotiator on these carrier deals obviously involves Qualcomm, because Qualcomm makes the chips that connect to the cellular networks. Okay. Mark Gurman, thank you so much for weighing in. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, as always. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Coming up next week on May 8th, Bloomberg will be hosting a Business of Equality Summit that will bring together business, academic, and political leaders, nonprofits, and activists to talk about the future of equality, how we get there, and what is at stake for the economy and society at large. Catch all those conversations all day long on Bloomberg Television and Radio. And a reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco. That is all for now. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. This is Bloomberg.